Who is excited for the last two-hour talk of the day? These guys have some awesome things they're going to show. And, and girl. <laughs> um, so, um, with no further delay, please give a warm welcome to Sve, Till, and Sogi presenting uh, at DEF CON 26 inside the fake science factory. Oh yeah, and if one falls over the other one because of the lav mics, um, um, I'll help them up. But uh, yeah, let's let's get you guys untangled first. Because it'll happen. But that should work. I yeah. Guess. Just leave it in front yeah. of you, so it's not behind you. Cool. You good? Right on. All right, give him another round of applause. So hi DEFCON, hi everyone. Thanks for having us. This is amazing. This is such an honor to speak in front of such a great audience here. Uh, my name is Till, Till Kraus. I'm a reporter and investigative journalist from Süddeutsche Zeitung, uh, Germany. Süddeutsche Zeitung magazine, a big uh, magazine from the German newspaper. And we're glad to be here today. My name, thanks. My name thanks. is Svea. I'm also an investigative reporter from Germany's biggest broadcaster, ARD. And the reason why, or one reason why we are here and why we are really excited to be here is that the whole research you're going to see now started right here at DEFCON. So this is for us also kind of a way of saying thank you DEFCON because of what this conference makes possible. And um, it started because last year I had a talk here and I met Chris. No? How about now? Yeah. I had that <laughs> same thing last year, I should learn. Um, I'm Chris, also answer to uh, Sugi. Um, I work for the Online Privacy Foundation, and I'm also a member of the DEF CON CFP Review Board. Uh, I didn't vote on my own talk, <laughs> <laughs> honestly. So to get you started, I mean, this is a really long talk, but it's basically divided into two parts. So what we're going to do now is give you the presentation and have a little bit of time for questions and answers. And then you're in for a treat because we're going to go show you a documentary film that we made about the subject matter that we're now talking about. So uh, you'll be well entertained, I think, I hope. And uh, after this documentary, we will still have some time for questions and answers. So if you guys want to know anything more that we're talking about, we're here to answer your questions. And before we totally dive into this, the fake science factory, what, what does it even mean, right? So we will talk today about something uh, that pretends to be science, but in fact is just bogus, or you could even call it bullshit sometimes. So, and in order to understand how important it is, let's think a little bit about what science means for society, right? So when you talk about science, it's not just academics working in ivory towers doing research. The results really influence the world, how we see the world, our perception of the world, what kind of things we buy, uh, what medications we take, how political decisions are influenced. A lot of this is based on science, and this makes it really important that science is actually working, the whole process of scientific publication. So uh, about a year ago, I was uh, fairly far along with some research. And with the research, I wanted to present an abstract and some preliminary findings at a conference. So I found this one, the uh, 19th International Conference on Political Psychology. Um, submitted an abstract. It got accepted. We were pretty delighted with that. Um, and that's a fairly standard thing to do in academia so that you can discuss your results with peers and that forms like the rest of your decision on how you write the rest of the paper. So off I went to Copenhagen uh, in Denmark in October last year, excited about the conference, you know, kind of bricking it about the presentation. And um, this was the conference. Not, <laughs> not a room in the conference. That's the conference. <laughs> and and all the attendees, right, except me. Uh, but um, I, I just thought, well, maybe that's like an admin error or something. Um, but then the talk started. And bearing in mind I'd submitted on political psychology, 
Um, the talks before mine were on urban planning, advanced Islamic finance, I'm not even sure what that really is, robotics, farming, um, all sorts of things. You know, get there, they say, okay, you've got five minutes to present, five minutes, they, you know, before they said it was 20 minutes, so you get those five, it's like all of a sudden, you're thinking this is a little bit weird, what the fuck? Um, <laughs> so, this sort of shenanigans has actually got a name, as I found out. Um, I'm the sort of schmuck that goes to these sort of places, apparently. And it's called predatory publishing. And uh, Till's going to talk to us a little bit more about that. So predatory publishing, what is this? So we try to nail it down to some sort of a formula based on Albert Einstein. Um, Euro is MC square. So this means that what predatory publishers are doing is they take something that is either scientific, like your talk, or something that is utterly non-scientific, they mix it all together to make a lot of money. And um, there's a definition for this, of course, so this is, this is kind of a broader, broader sociological problem, uh, where you see that those meetings are set up to peer, appear as if they are science, but they're not, because nobody's actually really looking at that, what, what, what people are publishing there. So my question to you guys would be, who here is either scientist or has a scientific background and knows a little bit about that? Let's have a show of hands. All right, that's quite a few people, but for the, for the rest of us, I'd just give you a very brief tour of how publications in the scientific world usually work. So you'll, in a good academic journal, you have an idea for a paper, you submit it, an editor checks it and could either reject it straight away or sends it to a process that is called peer review. Uh, so peer review is something where other scientists, other researchers who have some knowledge in that field um, look at your manuscript and make suggestions. They look, is the mythology okay? Is the data set okay? Are the conclusions in any way coherent? And uh, they read the paper, they make suggestions, and they can again reject it straight away if they say, nah, this doesn't make any sense, or they have it for revision. And a friend of mine who's a scientist, they, he calls the peer review a, a big pain in the ass, basically, because people always have some suggestions, and, and it's a very, very long and painful process. It can, it can take months, so it goes back and forth. You can have to resubmit it, another peer review, another possibility of rejection, but then in the end, after a long time, it gets abstracted. So, a little disclaimer here, the peer review process as we know it from the big journals that we know of, either open access journals on the internet or printed journals, it is not a perfect process. Sometimes weird papers slip through. Uh, the, the companies who, who, who run those big publications, uh, there's a big monopoly here, a lot of money to be made, so this is not a perfect system, but the whole idea of other scientists reviewing manuscripts still is kind of like the gold standard for academic publishing. So when we look at those predatory journals, things look quite a bit different. So the only thing they have in common is there is a submission, so somebody submits a paper there. Then you've got some superficial comments, if at all. Then you have to make a payment, and then it's accepted. So quite easy, right? <laughs> So, in, and in order to, to, to understand what we're talking about here, we have to make clear there are hundreds, if not thousands, of predatory publishers out there. They're a little bit like this Nigerian email scam that you guys probably know a lot about. Yeah, they send out emails in bulk, uh, trying to recruit authors, people to send their manuscripts there. And um, we looked at the five major companies behind that. One of them is Wazit, where you presented. Omics is another one from India. Uh, so those are the ones where, where a lot of journals are published. They have a lot of conference going on. So these are the major players in this field. So um, after finding out about this whole predatory publishing thing, uh, I wanted two things. I wanted uh, the 450 euros back. Um, uh, and I mean, that, the, the 450 euro thing is pretty standard. If you've been to like an IEEE conference, you have to pay for atten attendance. So it's like I, I, I didn't spot anything there. But more importantly, I wanted my intellectual property back. If anybody's written an abstract, it's kind of a pain in the ass and it takes a long time. So having to rewrite it so it doesn't fall prey of some sort of plagiarism engine uh, is, is, is a bit, bit of a frustrating thing. So um, I asked Wasit for my money back and them to withdraw the paper, and they were like, no, um, <laughs> you signed the forms, here they are. Um, so, you know, I had to, uh, 
had to then go to the credit card company and explain what a credit conference was, uh, and that's not that easy. So, you know, you went to a conference? Uh, yes, but it wasn't really a conference. R right, but there was a conference, uh, sort of. Uh, so I had to write a detailed description for that and also to send to the uh, UK fraud authorities to kind of explain what was, what was going on so I could get my money back. I took all the information I'd written up and I just put it on a, a WordPress site, wassetwatch.wordpress.com. Um, I also found all the authors that were going to be attending in the next 12 months and emailed all of those folks that were from universities and said, hey, you might be going to a, a, a shitty conference. Uh, I also created a, a Twitter account, Wasset Watch, um, to warn people who were talking about uh, Wasset. And I also pinged Svea here, who I met last year at DEF CON, and said this. Yes, this is exactly the message I received. And I would say, don't mess with him, because he knows me. I'm badass <laughs> on, on Saturdays. <laughs> and, um, and this is uh, yeah, where, where the story begins with the whole investigation. So we decided, as a media organization, um, to dive into it and to go on and research this as deep as we could and to really yeah, kind of rip them apart. So I teamed up with Till and also with another good colleague of mine, which together we are quite a big investigator of our research corporation in Germany. And one of the first things what we thought what we should do was we need some help. And I don't, I don't know who saw my talk last year um, knows that I, I love to dress up. So, <laughs> So we needed some help, and uh, <laughs> my alter ego was uh, Isabella Stein, and we decided to, uh, to become a scientist. And Isabella Stein, she was from a small university, the University of Himmelpforten. Himmelpforten, it's a village in Germany. <laughs> I don't know, a couple of hundreds people living there, and we believe that Santa Claus um, is coming from there. So it was Isabella. <laughs> It was Isabella Stein from this Fictures University, and also together with my good colleague, um, we submitted a fake paper. This paper was randomly gener generated by a, com <laughs> by a computer algorithm. <laughs> so. Oh, that, there's more. I'm sure, I'm sure you, you all get that, right? <laughs> this is a very neat, neat program. You can find it on the web. It's called SciGen, and um, some MIT students invented this, this program. You just have to type in your name, your fixture's name, and then a paper jumps out. And this was the one when we typed in our fixture's name. This was the paper which came out. So fake paper number one is Sting Operation. We decided to go to the same uh, conference um, people where Chris uh, was. Uh, they call themselves Vazet, the World Academy of Science and Technology. And we hardly believed ourselves when they invited us for the conference. <laughs> so we went to London. It's, this is not this one. We went to London in, in January and presented there. And yeah, let's, let's see how Isabella Stein and uh, Christian Schreibaumer, how they did. And we really, we read it out loud. <laughs> okay. Let's see if we get that running. So, yes, the yeah. first one. It's, it's a, it's, it's edited a little bit. Uh, introduce us uh, shortly. It's my colleague Isabella Stein, um, also from, from um, our University of Applied Sciences. See here now is the relationship between our solution and the analysis of the memory bus. This is memory bus. <laughs> and here on the bottom and the top and all of this investigation where you would need a theory of rat like trees, but we propose another solution. Uh, we used the 90s Nintendo Game Boy. <laughs> uh, that Which means the more pressure you give on the system, the higher the scalability gets, and that's what we wanted to achieve. 
How would Elsie do the head in here? You all know this. The single particle is a reflection of quantum potentiality. The, the Greek philosopher Plato. Thank you. Uh, introduce us uh, shortly. It's my colleague Isabella Stein, um, also from from. Uh... Sorry, you, you Zara. <laughs> Thank you, guys. The hardest part was was really not not to laugh, and <laughs> and I and I have to admit. After our little theater, we, we nearly ran out the room in the next room, and, and we, we couldn't stop it for a while. <laughs> so, but, I mean, it's funny, but on the other hand, it's, it's sad at once. And uh, everybody uh, applauded, and I think they were very polite people, polite scientists, but also there were no computer experts. So there was probably a chemist or or biologist or a film critical critics person, so they they couldn't know about what we were speaking, and this is also a reason why these conferences are, are so shitty. Oh, I didn't want to spoil that one. <laughs> so. This one is uh, the organizer. Uh, this was the only person there who was from the World Academy of Science and Technology. And uh, I asked him, who are you? What's your name? And he barely, oh, he did not want to answer. And he mumbled something like, I, I'm only a student from Cyprus. And I don't know anything about this. And so we kind of, it stopped here um, in London because we, yeah, we could not find out who is that guy and who is behind was it. And this was also a time when we needed some help more from a hacker person to, to dive deeper. So um, I called a, a friend of mine, um, Andrew McPherson. And Andrew McPherson's like employee number one of Perturva who make Multigo. I don't know if you've not heard of Multigo, it's kind of a a tool for exploring relationships and technical and non-technical contexts, and it's, it's pretty awesome. And the uh, creator of Multigo created this graphic for us because he was pretty excited by the talk too. So in order to try and find out a little bit more about who's behind this wasit.org organization, we plug this into uh, Multigo, or rather Andrew did on this occasion, and we run a transform that uh, shows um, entries from who is, and we found out that wasset.org was using Cloudflare, which is you know a, a little bit of a pain because it's a bit of a, a dead end, but not really a pain um, because what we found with wasset.org is that it was using the same tracking cookie as uh, iasp.org, iasp.org, and wasset.com. Um, then, if we look at the IP ownership for those guys, we see it links to a guy called Bora Ardil, and Bora Ardil is the guy. And the student there, the student there, that uh, Svea met in London. Uh, Bora Ardil also posts on PHP Freaks under the name or the alias of, uh, of Plobus. And you can get some interesting information about the sort of the structure of the WASIT organization um, by some of his posts on PHP Freak. So back to uh, Multigo and looking at the Who is information, we also see there. Um, that if we look at the oh, what is it uh, ios.org practice this a million times uh, it references a, a gentleman called uh, Kamel Ardil I'm not sure if I'm pronouncing that right but this is the guy here uh, Kamel's really the sort of the the um, top of the tree for wasit.org uh, wasit it's a family business he's Boris's father and there's another Ardil as well involved three of them we think. Um, if we look at Bora, he's also um, registered uh, a ton of other conference type DNS names, 83 in total, like Conference University and Scientific Conference and stuff like that. 
So in total, WASIT uh, hosts about 13 events in 13 different cities each month. So they're quite busy. 5,000 conference, conference uh, titles a month, a year. That's 157 events, 48 cities, 35 countries, and 53,467 conference titles in total. Anything you can think of, and if it's not there, there's an opportunity to suggest one. <laughs> so we estimated based on about 20 to 25 submissions per um, event that they're making, or the annual revenue is about 3.8 million euros a year, or about 4.5 million US dollars. Um, even if there are overheads for the hotel rooms, and they don't necessarily need to book the hotel conference rooms all day, my conference lasted two whole hours. Um, so even if it costs them two million, that's quite a lot of revenue, uh, a profit that they're, they're making from, uh, from this. And this is just Wasset. Oh yeah, another video. Yeah, we, we, we of course tried to speak with them about this. So we went to another conference in Berlin, but this time not German Isabella. German Radio and TV and Süddeutsche Zeitung. Uh, we have several questions to you. Is this science? Is this science? If Why was you, you, you yes, call yes, this yes. a scientific conference? So what is scientific about this conference? Informatica, was it of the IRC? Oh, so, let me call yeah. the lawyer. Just yeah. wait. Let me call the lawyer. No, no, no. No, face no, it. no, 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 no. You will face it. Yeah, yeah. yeah. No. Federal police. Uh, <laughs> Yes, German this, radio and TV and this was uh, the end of it, so we got thrown out. We we got thrown out, and we we did we didn't get any answers from them until today. So the only answers or the only information we have are the information we have from from Chris. Okay, so after this encounter with these weird people and these weird conferences, we really thought, okay, let's let's look deeper into what's going on there. We know that a lot of those conference organizers also have a big uh, publication arm where they publish journals and uh, scientific articles. So we thought, okay, if they accept any computer generated nonsense, and you had a good laugh at that because you obviously were able to see what kind of crap that was, uh, let's see, to, let's try to put this on the next level, right? Let's try to have a scientific article published in one of their journals. So. We really try to think, what would the bad guys do, right? So we try to have a, uh, we invented a cancer cure, complete nonsense, and had the goal to have it published in one of the journals so that we could say, well, this is a scientifically proven medication that we could then sell, for example, over the internet. Because who would buy just some random medication on the internet when you can buy one that says, this is proven by scientists in a peer-reviewed journal? So. What we did, we, for some reason, we like bees, because bees are awesome. Can bees heal cancer? Probably not. But who knows, right? In the world of scientific publications that are fake, anything's possible. So we invented another institution, the eFabier Institute. We made a Twitter account and a website. The Twitter account logo actually is the German symbol for recycling. So this was a little hint for the, for the trash that we're going to put out to the world. Um, <laughs> The CEO of this is Dr. Richard Funden, which in Germany means erfunden, which means invented. So the whole thing was, 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 was pretty bad. And um, we submitted a paper to one of the journals from Omics, which is one of the biggest um, uh, um, companies in that field, the Journal of Integrative Oncology looks legit at a very first glance. So we wrote a paper saying that the wax that bees produce can have a better effect on cancer treatment than chemotherapy. So we just, we just said that, right? There was no proof. We said, oh yeah, we had some patients, and we basically asked them as long as we wanted until they actually said, yeah, we feel better. This was our mythology. And um, we, <laughs> we made some other outrageous claims. Um, for example, we said, well, one of the reasons why bees may be a good you know, therapy option for cancer patients is because bees don't get cancer. <laughs> right? <laughs> Makes perfect sense. Um, the other argument we had was that, well, the general nature of bees, you know, how they fly around and those are really happy animals, that pretty much suggests that they're probably a good way to treat cancer. And we even, because we're scientists, we quoted a book. You know, we just didn't say that bees have a very, very happy nature. 
We looked it up in a book and we quoted it in the reference section. The only problem is it's a children's book, <laughs> right? <laughs> so we really, we really try to make it low stake so that anybody, not, not, a, not like the, the, a Nobel Prize winning scientist is needed to find out that this is utterly nonsense, right? But guess what happened? After a couple of days, we got review comments back from the publisher and they said, oh yeah, this provides important experimental and preclinical evidences. There was no evidence at all. It was just completely invented. Uh, they had some minor corrections that they didn't understand an abbreviation, what SITF means, which is not hard that they didn't understand it because we just made it up. So we said, oh yeah, SITF stands for Signal Infer Transfer Protocol. And they said, oh sure, yeah, okay. <laughs> And we got an email around 10 days after we handed in the sub the manuscript and the paper was accepted and published. Um, they wanted to have 2,000 euros, so two point something thousand dollars for a publication fee, which we never paid and they still published the paper. So it was <laughs> online there and it doesn't stop there. So uh, after a while when the paper was online, we received several emails from other predatory publishers uh, inviting us to be editors at cancer journals and one email that I put up on the screen here we got invited to be keynote speakers at a breast cancer conference in Paris. So what a career, right? We just invented this whole operation and within two weeks we had a scientific publication that we could put on the website and saying this is officially peer reviewed. We were able to speak at a conference and we're editors of journals. So if we really had the plan to sell this fake medication, we would have some arguments now. And this sounds funny at first and believe us, we had a lot of fun doing this, but it's actually really serious because this is not something that we just made up. This is something that is really happening. So there are various medications or alleged medications out there which are proven in these journals. For example, it, it did not took us a long time to find GCMAP. GCMAF um, is supposed to help against last stage cancer and a variety of other, other illnesses you, 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 you may have. And um, it is uh, something that you take it and then your immune system gets so strong that cancer is, is beaten. So, and they advertise with these studies really, yeah, quite often. So we just want to show or give you a short glimpse of what you can do with these studies. Um, it's particularly relevant for the drug oxy 300 scientists from eight nations have written 150 scientific research papers on GCMF. 200 scientists, but we have written 32 of them. Yes, this is uh, uh, advertisement. Go on, go on, let it, let it play. And you will see now testimonials from this company. I took the GCMAF twice a week, and after three weeks, I started to feel less tired. It isn't um, something that's, um, you know, just quackery. It, it is scientifically backed. So we will now have a short it's look into the, um, the studies. 300 scientists from eight nations have written 150 scientific research papers on GCMAF. 200 scientists but we have written 32 of them. He wants to stay with us. I took the GC math twice a week and after three weeks I started to feel less tired. It isn't um, something that's, um, you know, just quackery. It, it is scientifically backed. Hey. Okay. There we go. <laughs> It's a good advertisement, right? You can see it a couple of times. 300 scientists <laughs> so. from eight well, nations. Is, yeah, can you have make it stop? <laughs> <laughs> but I think, I think you're getting the idea, right? So uh, this is what makes this whole fake science operation so, so dangerous that people can actually sit in front of a camera and say this is not just quackery, it's scientifically backed. And I mean, let's be honest, who really has the background to double check those studies, right? Yes, and uh, here you see some of the studies from this com from from this um, from this com company, and these studies they are in, one of them is in the journal where Till submitted the BWAX paper, 
Uh, others are in journals where we submitted a computer-generated fake paper. So you have no peer review or you have some kind of fake peer review because this is the only reason why these papers get, yeah, get published. So what we did was um, we showed these uh, studies to an, um, quite a well-known oncologist in Germany. And she, yeah, she, she reviewed these studies for a second time and she said these studies are uh, really terrible and that she thinks that a normal person can't see it. And even a doctor, if he's not very familiar with it, even a doctor can't see it. Because these studies, they, they only take care about single cases, for example. They are not scientifically at all, and they should not have been published in any real journal. So her conclusion was that these studies only exist, um, that these internet pages where these products are sold can link to these scientific articles. And this is quite bad, especially for the patients when they are very, very ill and when they are searching hopelessly for some miracle or for some cure. And this is also the way how these studies are spreading over social media or over, um, yeah, over other media, over articles in, in media. So it also took us not long to find somebody who also spread the word. This is a very beloved um, TV host from Germany. She died in 2016 because she was severely ill. She had breast cancer in the last stage. And she wrote a book, and in this book, she, she really spoke very advertising and well about GC math and that yeah, this is her last hope. We also spoke to her best friend, and she told us that this was her last hope, this medication. And she was nobody who believed in some wonder healer or something. She believed in the studies because she read them by herself. So she died. And on this case, you really can see that this is a business with last hopes and that these people who are publishing these um, failed studies, that they are making money with the hopes of um, dying people. So usually there are no consequences. In this case, luckily there are. So the one company who's selling that stuff is, is going to go on trial in London in November. And the files allege that they illegally saw GCMAP as a cancer drug based on failed studies. We also um, tried to reach out to them, but our, our questions were ignored. So what's the matter with all this? Many snake oil sellers, they can use this and then they can sell their stuff. We found plenty of other medications, like some very uh, some stem cell therapies, um, which which can't be working, or some uh, a bioenergy healer who has 150 studies um, who heals with his energy. So you, there's plenty of them out there, and they can sell their products because of these um, predatory publishers. So. This was a reason, another reason for us to build a bigger picture. We wanted to know who else is there. And the first step was to write as many fake papers as we could and get them accepted at, I think, in the end, 12 different publisher. That one, th this one was mine. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, got it, accepted. It got accepted. We've got a real scientist here, right? <laughs> so. mm. Thank you. But to be honest, two or three papers did not get accepted, so that, that works as well. One wrote back to us, uh, this is meaningless, do something, do something better in the next future. So we felt some kind of didn't accept it, but the absolute majority accepted the paper without any comments. Uh, yeah, after we asked them, this publisher, why, why did you, um, why did you accept this, or you are predatory? Most of them said no comment. Some said, no, we are not predatory publisher even if they accepted two papers from us. Or this one I, I, I like the most, they said, we are a platform, so we, we, we are not responsible. But yeah, we, we wanted to, to go and to dig deeper. Yeah, so to uh, gather some information from the various uh, predatory journals, we did some scraping and analyzing, or spidering, scraping and analyzing, one of those. Um, 
And we'll start off with scraping, which we divide into sort of two sections. So first is we want to look at the abstract and papers that have been submitted and all of the information that goes with those. And the other thing we wanted to do was look at all of the conferences and where they are and how frequently. So the first step we did is like do some sort of site recon. And in this example, we just look at WASIT real quick. We get some ideas of this, uh, the site layout and what we want to um, set our spiders to and what we want to scrape and then later parse. So you see the papers and the abstracts are uh, listed here and they're linked to more detail. Um, and here you get things like the author name, the journal title, things like that. Um, and also you get this like unique identifier for the abstracts and they range from about zero to uh, 100,000. So you can write some, or I wrote some messy Python to just loop through all of those and download the HTML files. Um, of which there are 53,069 for WASIT, um, and then pulled out the uh, meta, uh, metadata, the title, author, date, journal name, stuff like that, uh, and piped that all to a CSV file. There's no real magic there. Um, it was you know, quite straightforward. Um, the resultant abstract uh, .csv file had uh, all of the things we just saw, the paper ID, uh, it had the, uh, the author, stuff like that, and a direct download link to uh, the PDF, which would either be the PDF version of the abstracts or the paper, and that, those PDFs contained uh, more information, such as the institutions authors were at and, um, and their email addresses. So we pulled down the PDFs, use PDF to text and pipe some of that information into abstracts.csv as well. Others on the team um, preferred a slightly more elegant approach using um, Scrapey, for example, where you're really doing your sort of spidering and parsing all in one and you get your sort of uh, JSON file out of it. Uh, next, moving on to conferences real quick. Uh, there are 50 different sort of conference areas within uh, WASIT, and each of them linked to hundreds, uh, together collectively thousands of, uh, of conference titles. So 50 subject areas, and here we see one subject area, and that's just a small snippet of the different conferences in that subject area uh, in August 2018. And the reason why they all have those abbreviations, you know, you see like ICI something, uh, that's done on purpose because legitimate uh, scientific conferences usually go by those acronyms. So what was it did is they just changed one of the letters around so that it that it almost sounded like the original conference, but not quite. And so this tricked people into believing, oh, I'm going to this very reputable conference, whereas it was just you know as valuable as a as as, as, as a Gucci bag written with one C. So you you could have been at this conference, but you chose to come to DEFCON. Uh, now, just finished in Vancouver, and apparently they had scenes when uh, a lot of the attendees, the penny dropped for them. Um, so there was a bit of a backlash there, apparently. So altogether, there are 44,476 different conference titles you can select. There's going to be one for you. And if you're the kind of person that likes to plan in advance, <laughs> DT, take note. Um, and look at all of the wonderful cities you could travel to. You'll get a receipt um, and an attendance voucher and all of that sort of stuff. 2031. So we take um, what we did there with WASIT, but we applied that to all of the five um, uh, predatory publishers that we looked at. We get the JSON files, the CSV files, and we use a collection of tools to do various different analysis depending on who we were and what we were looking for. So Excel, Tableau, which is, uh, you can get a 15-day free license uh, or, or trial license for that, Neo4j for a, a graph visualization, Lincurious, and of course like R and Python uh, as well. So on to uh, analyzing the data that we downloaded. Yes, it felt like like lowering a curtain, like looking behind the scene, because after the scraping process, we could finally say, okay, this is how big you are, this is how many abstracts you have. So we wanted to know how many authors. So we found nearly 180,000 abstracts and around 400,000 authors contributing to this scam worldwide. And uh, this, maybe some people would say, oh my God, science in danger. So, no, 
so this is, if you compare it to the total number of scientists, with, which are nearly 8 million scientists worldwide, this is still a very small proportion. Um, so most of the scientists are publishing in, in regular journals, open access journals or paper journals, and only a very small proportion fell is for, for this scam. But the development is quite interesting. You see here that especially with the big ones, omics and Vazet, that they have had quite an increase, especially in the last three to five years. They're getting bigger and bigger, making more money. And many people out there are saying that this is a problem from lower income countries. No, it's not. The US is the second biggest contributor to this conference, especially omics with nearly 10,000 abstracts. And what is interesting if you dive deeper into the data when you are searching for universities or when you are looking for who is contributing to them, this goes in every field. There's nearly no university you won't find there. So even elite universities have published there over the past 10 years. I have to admit, so probably one can say, okay, this is not too much, but anyway, these are the numbers we, we pulled out of the metadata from the paper. I also did here for DEF CON, especially a top US institutions list, also out of interest because I wanted to know which universities are on top of this list. Here is, it is an institution, it's the Mayo Clinic, I think it's a pretty well known institution, University of Michigan, Wayne State University. I wrote all of the universities you can read here. I, I wrote all of them email, asked for their comment. Most of them did not comment on the issue. Some did. So one here I, I want to, to read. So they are really dismayed about this. They were really kind of concerned. When I, I talked to them on the phone, they were like, oh my god, we did not know this. And we, we don't like this that our scientists are publishing there and they want to take care and they want to take action to stop this and to warn and to inform their people about this. So most interesting is what are the reasons why scientists do this? So first of all, scientists got scammed. We were talking about the Nigeria scam. So this is, they are sending spam emails and you fell for it accidentally. Then you go there once and then you see, okay, this is crap, you won't go there twice. Also, there's the publish or perish pressure in academia, so probably some people choose the easy way because it's just fast to publish there. And the third case, I want to go a little bit deeper because um, this is for us, it was the most interesting case when um, scientists are taking advantage of this predatory publishing. So we were lucky um, to find one case where there is, there is an investigation ongoing. Um, so we, this is from CUNY University, City University of New York. And there are quite some professors who really like predatory publishers. So they don't publish there once or twice. No, 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 no. They publish there quite many times. So what you find in these papers, when you print them out, you find that there's some kind of authors filing. You find that nine to 15 authors for one paper, which is um, not normal. Then all of these papers are grant funded. So this is usually taxpayers' money, which is in these papers. Then a lot of these papers is copy paste. So if you run this through a software, you really see that, yeah, that there's a lot of copy paste going on. And if you take them to a scientist to do a peer review, what we did, then, it, then they told us, okay, some of this, what is in there is really scientifically questionable because probably they were written in a very short time. Um, we were lucky to have had a whistleblower who was familiar with this case, with this CUNY case, and he, he told us that professors can benefit from gaining higher salaries at promotions because they, they probably have some legit papers from, from good journals and then they can just fill it up with this uh, cheap publications. Um, they can also can obtain other benefits. 
and uh, this was the reason yeah why why this is or this could be the reason why this is so liked for some for minority um, of people and which we find interesting is that even if you do this knowingly or unknowingly it doesn't really matter because you are feeding the system with this the predatory publishers they get the money from the universities so this is one thing and so they can grow with their business model and the other thing is they get the reputation of the universities they can advertise with oh people from Stanford are publishing here or people from Harvard are publishing here so even if the scientists don't know so even if they do this un unknowingly they are helping the predatory publishing and they are helping a different group where Till will know more about. Yeah, so when we looked at this, we, we thought, well, this goes way beyond academia, right? So it's one thing if professors try to, to polish their publication lists and get more money maybe or have a better reputation, but this whole business can really be used for all kinds of purposes because we as a society, we still have this kind of feeling that if something is scientifically proven, it's kind of valuable. And this is great that this is the case because usually science does exactly that. But in the case of the predator, uh, it is quite different. So we not only looked what academics are doing there, but we looked what our companies and lobby groups and political influencers are doing there. Because in the end, big companies and big corporations have research and development departments where they present their own research uh, and their new products and all these kind of things. And oftentimes what they find is not really scientifically sound, but good enough for the predators, right? So, one big branch, of course, the tobacco industry. Uh, they have a reputation, and I, I think most of you guys here know about this, they have a reputation for deceiving the public for, for decades, uh, trying to downplay the, the danger of secondhand smoking or the dangers of smoking altogether. You probably know that spiel, right? It's like, oh, well, cancer has many reasons and smoking may be one and maybe not. I don't know, let's leave. You know, that's kind of what they do sometimes. And so what they do now, particularly Philip Morris is a company that we found there quite often, uh, the, the producer of Marlboro, you probably know them. So they, they, they start to revamp their business a little bit by selling uh, e-cigarettes uh, that are potentially less harmful as they claim. They have scientists uh, writing about this and where does the science sometimes end? In the predatory publishers. So they have those well-looking brochures that they hand out to investors and to the public uh, where, they, where, they, where they make their health claims and uh, they list the articles here as peer-reviewed uh, and they are from Was It. You know, they were published in Was It and we know what Was It is, right? We got a best presentation award for reading a computer-generated nonsense paper there. So, well, not quite reputable, I guess. So, but this is not a one-time shot. Philip Morris seems to be quite a good customer for them. So they publish all kinds of studies in those non-peer-reviewed journals that claim to have a peer review. They go to conferences, present their, their research there. And particularly for the tobacco industry, it's interesting because for some serious academic conferences, they are banned. They're not even allowed to go there because of their history of deceiving the public. Uh, they're on a blacklist. So they just, it seems that they found another way to disseminate their research to, to kind of boost their reputation. Who else is there? Pharmaceutical companies, the pharma giant Bayer from Germany, uh, inventor of aspirin, uh, they published there quite a few papers and one of them is actually interesting because it, it actually has to do with aspirin, right? Their flagship product um, because they want to sell different variations of aspirin. They, have, they come up with uh, aspirin plus C, which is basically just normal aspirin with vitamin plus C uh, added. Uh, they have a paper here claiming that this helps against the common cold, whereas many other scientists that we showed the paper say, well, this is not actually a legitimate claim. Uh, the German Pro Consumer Protection Agency actually says that the addition of vitamin C doesn't make any sense in this case, but you can sell it at a higher price. So, if you are a consumer and you want to find out, oh, well, there's this normal aspirin and there's this aspirin plus C, you probably go to the internet, look up what the benefits are, and you end up here. So if you Google aspirin plus C, the omics paper, and let's keep in mind, this is non-peer reviewed, this is just any, you know, any study you can have published there, is on the second rank on, on Google. So I think now with you guys actually looking it up and, and, and clicking on the link, you may actually make it 
rise to the top. <laughs> so I guess that's the collateral damage of a talk like this. But well, let's give this to Bayer. They can have it. Okay. Um, so I think I think you you understand what's going on here, right? Uh, other companies, Malincrod, very controversial company that's just recently been fined a hundred million dollars uh, for absurd and obscene increasement of the prices for the medications. They published there about uh, medications there. AstraZeneca is doing it. Lobby groups, ILSI Europe, a think tank funded by Coca-Cola, Hershey's and Kellogg's, they sent their scientists over to a conference speaking about childhood obesity and nutrition. And guess what? It was not about salad, right? So they used this kind of uh, forum to disseminate their research. What else did we find? We, we were kind of a run, right? We were typing in other companies. So we found critical infrastructure. Framatom, a company that's responsible for the uh, nuclear safety, they published things there. Uh, at was it again, you know, the, uh, the, the company that we just saw. And it just goes on and on. Institutions from Germany, uh, basically tax, taxpayers' money, goes up, they present their stuff there. Uh, and once you publish the scientific publication, it just doesn't end there, you know? So it, it's cited in other publications, other people, you know, cited. It's cited in, in patents, for example, yeah, for somebody p making patents on medical products. They cite was it publications there. And what we found particularly disturbing, there's this whole big group of climate change deniers, the, the CO2 coalition, for example, here in the United States, very, very controversial people. Uh, you've got the Eike Institute in Germany that is uh, scientifically uh, working together with the German right-wing party, AFD. Uh, they speak in front of parliaments in Germany, actually presenting their view that climate change is not man-made, this is all not a problem, and we should all you know, further invest in coal and all these kind of things. Uh, they use studies in those journals to back up their claims. So this is a very common strategy in, in scientific political propaganda that you say, well, look, on the one hand, you've got all those award-winning scientists, those great you know, thinkers who come up with their, with their theories and their proofs, but we've got other studies that just say a different, you know, that just say the opposite. And in this case, we could really prove that their arguments come from predatory publishers. And how do we know? Well, we just actually submitted a computer-generated nonsense paper at the exact same journal and got accepted like this. So in order to kind of conclude this first part, we really have to think again what does science mean? And we got back to the slide from the beginning. So this is not just about, you know, your common professor doing a little bit of research on the side. Scientific progress is really a, and a super important driver for our society in the age of enlightenment and democracy. So what scientists find out influences not only political decisions, but what we buy, how we think, and how we see the world. And if you now, with the knowledge that you all have now about the predatory publishers, I think you see the danger that is in place there. And anything can be disseminated. Anything can have the aura of science. Nobody checks it. And when we confronted many universities, they were absolutely, they were absolutely clueless. They have never heard of this problem before. And so the societies, those, those, those studies, they're spreading like viruses. You know, they're quoted here, they're quoted there. Lots of dangerous things are happening. Uh, you can, in the end, no longer distinguish fiction from fact. So the most terrible thing that could happen with this whole thing is that the trust that we have in science erodes because we think science is awesome. We think science is great. And when they do this thing, they, they really sell themselves at a very, very cheap price. And the, the trust that we have in science and progress may erode. You know, if, if, if more people publish in those journals, the trust is gone. And this would be really terrible. So in order to kind of combat this, we really made a long streak of investigative projects where we published the findings that we had together with 23 media partners and journalists around the world where we shared the data and people from other countries, be it Korea or India or the United States or Austria, uh, France, they looked into specific cases from their countries. Which universities are there? Which companies are there? Uh, Germany, from the 30 biggest companies, 12 had publications in those journals. And this, this big kind of uh, publication really uh, had the aim to raise awareness. As I said, don't mess with him. Yeah. <laughs> it's or, all because of, of, of Chris, yeah. Or of DEFCON, right? <laughs> so, those are some of the results um, of the publications that came out, and there's more to come. The Guardian just ran a story today, and, and there's more coming up uh, for this in the future. So 
never end a talk without a call to action. That's what we learned, right? So we're speaking in front of a very, very curious and interested audience here. So I think what, what you all can do is you can actually help to make this problem go away. When you find a study that somebody, some wacky person cites and says, oh, you know what, uh, autism doesn't exist or uh, uh, um, all, you know, tobacco is not harmful, look where this publish, look where this study has been published and if you find it to be from a predatory publisher, say so and, and share, the, share the word. Um, spread the word about those, those, those companies. If you look up your university or if you have academic friends, warn them, tell them that this is actually hurting science by publishing in those journals and again, we know that academic publishing has its flaws and, and, and even the established publishers do some mistakes, but what those predators are doing is really hurting everyone. So the big point is here, you all can help with this project because you don't even need the database and all those, those files. This is just if you want to dive deeper, but if you have a, a simple Google string search that Svea is just about to tweet out on her account, um, if you enter any, any, any word there, be it a university uh, email address that you know of, be it a controversial product that you have heard of, be it a controversial person or anything that you want, if you, if you Google it through this, the chances are really high that you will find if this comes from a predatory publisher or not. Look, and, uh, look for government. We found a lot of government in Germany. Yeah. So look for surveillance because this would be very interesting if some surveillance stuff is sold with this with these studies. Yeah, the military is there sometimes too, right? Because all those people, they need publications, they need the, 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 the aura of science, and this is the cheap and easy way to do it. Oh yeah, there was, there was a .gov that just uh, submitted to the Vancouver conference that had just, just been, so you could look for that. Yeah. <laughs> so, I think this concludes the first part of our presentation. There's, of course, this was a big research and a big work from a lot of people. So. This whole project is more than the three people here, so we thank all the people on, on, on this chart and uh, want to invite you to stick around for the documentary that we're just about to show. And um, yeah, we are approachable on Twitter. If you find something, get in touch with us. We're, we'll hang around after the show here, of course. Uh, come talk to us. We share our knowledge. Uh, and we thank you very, very much for the attention. Uh, this has been great. This has been a pleasure. Thank DEF you. CON, you guys rock. So we'll uh, we'll get the we'll get the documentary uh, we'll get the documentary set up. I mean, if those guys would have just given me my money back when I asked, <laughs> you know, yeah. that rug really tied the room together. Yeah. And so the documentary that we're showing now, of course, is, uh, is, is subtitled, so you will understand it. And uh, if you have any questions now while we're setting up the laptop, we're we're happy to answer. If there's a quick question, we have some time. So yeah. come, come in front or speak it out so yeah. loud. That Say it loud so that we can hear it. I think there's a question here, yeah. So of the papers that you did research, of those, how many were really legitimate? Well, the, the question was from the papers that we looked up, how many of them were really legitimate? That is a very great question and it's, it, the answer is it's hard to tell because only some of them that we really found out were seemingly really dangerous, for example with the cancer medications, we gave them to other legitimate scientists to look them up. So we didn't of course control all of the papers and see how good they are, but we really think the problem is that it is almost impossible to tell the difference. So we kind of had the comparison like in Germany you have like a big um, institution that every car has to go there. I think it's like the DMV here or something, right? You get stickers on your car that checks if everything is okay. Those predatory publishers are like, like the DMV just putting the stickers on any car without looking at them. Most cars will probably be okay. Some of them will have exhumes that are poisonous and some of them won't have breaks because nobody looked at them. And this is the problem with those journals that nobody looks at them so the filtering function is gone. Now everything is science and everything is peer reviewed and you can't tell the difference. So we, we invite everyone here to find papers and, and, and go for a hunt and look, uh, look it up and if you have expert friends and you find a paper, show it to them and, and, and share, share the knowledge. So. And if um, authors are publishing papers to these places and kind of leaving them there, uh, granted sometimes it's hard to get your paper removed so that's a factor, but if people are publishing there, which is kind of deceptive in its own right, then 
you have to then wonder, is the whole pool polluted? How was the research methodology and the data? We just don't know. And when there are um, open access and pre, uh, uh, was it pre -pub paper, you know, uh, sites like uh, Archive and uh, OSF.io, you have to question why researchers aren't, aren't publishing there in, instead. So it's really difficult to, to sort of extract what's what's real and what's not and why people what were the people's motivations for for publishing there but well, we've got another question there yeah please yeah, do you have any evidence that the, the conferences scam and the publishing scam are separate scams like are people going to the conferences but not really publishing mm -hmm. or publishing for like one conferences or are they pretty well linked do you have any, any connections on that well, so the question was how those business models of the conferences and the publications are, are intertwined. And, and the answer is yes, they are absolutely intertwined. Like, for example, Omics, one of the, the, the key players in this, they offer both. They do a lot of conferences and they do a lot of journals. And there's currently actually an FTC investigation here in the United States against Omics because of their deceptive practices. And uh, so, yes, a lot of people who publish there also go to the conferences. Of course, there's some separations as well. Some people only go to conferences. Others only publish, but many do both. Full package, right? Another question. Another question on this. So, do you see this potentially jeopardizing any degrees, like PhD degrees, yeah. that are independent on these publications? Yeah. yeah. We so. we actually we researched one case in Germany uh, where we had a professor, and in Germany it is like uh, you have to. To, to collect papers, and if you have enough paper, then you are a professor. And in this case, we found his, um, yeah, his work, and uh, a lot of his work was from predatory publishers, and he was a professor. He was actually a turbo professor, because he was very young. I think he actually had uh, two or three PhD degrees, and uh, he was a very young professor. And yeah, we called him. Uh, yeah, <laughs> he yeah. sweated a lot. We, we did a lot of phone calls, we, we, we didn't publish his name, but if the people don't look closely, they may not see it, that it is published in predatory journals. What's his name? <laughs> <laughs> Poor guy. Yeah, there was also, I'm um, oh, sorry, question over there. Mm -hmm. So fantastic job of all, everything that you've done. Thanks. We were really often asked for so doing the, this. The, the question was, are we going to make the database available? Mm -hmm. uh, sorry. But we, we can't do this because um, it's a legal problem. Because in Germany, it is when you publish a person's name, then you first have to give him the opportunity to, to say something uh, for these allegations. Uh, and with 400,000 scientists, this would not be possible for us. So the only thing what we can do, and this is what we did here, um, is to publish this easy Google search so that everybody can check his institution. And um, we try to help um, people to do the scraping or probably to do a scraping project, put it on GitHub so that everybody can do it because we cannot publish the whole database um, in the web. Yeah, go on, please. Great question, yes. So, so when you mm -hmm. run your search here, mm -hmm. you, know, you might catch someone who didn't even know that they were involved. Yeah. That is a good question. So the question was if we came across the fact that some of those journals, they actually list people there as editors or editorial board members. And yes, we, we came across tons of people who were just there, either who were already dead. <laughs> that happens. Um, so not a lot of editorial work from their side. Or um, people who are absolutely clueless about this. Because you know those website photos, they're public. They're, the CVs are public. So those predatory publishers just take the photos on the website, put them up there, and when we ask them, uh, we wrote emails to those people. We looked them up and said, did you know that you're a publisher there or an editor there? And a lot of people replied, I have never heard of this. And they tried now legal, some legal steps to get their pictures removed, but we don't know how this will end. But with the scraping, the scraping code 
only uh, took the papers and the abstracts. The scraping code did not include the editors, but what the scraping code of course included was um, paper who probably where people want to retract it but, but, but didn't get through it. So yes, of course, in the 400,000 scientists there, there might be a quota of people who is in there but who definitely not want to be in there. And uh, there's a question over. So maybe over. let's take one or two more questions, I guess. Yeah, I think then one, one we more, will have more questions after the document. One more question. The guy has been standing patiently with his arm. Um, you, yeah. So you guys can't publish a database, but you have all this information. You showcase one product. Are you going to be tracking down more products that are relying solely on this research? You mean like the GCMF case? Yeah. Well, we're investigating still in, in, into the data. Yeah. So there, there, there's more, there's more stuff coming up there. But we really hope from input from other people because some of those, some of those findings, you just have to come across them. You know, we don't know about any wonder drug that's sold in Minnesota or South Korea or wherever around the world those 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 snake oil sellers do their business. So yeah, of course, we still keep looking into these into these uh, data sets and, and and see what we can find. But since it's kind of easy to find those products, we really hope that other people pick it up and and and, and do the work as well. Yeah, the Google search will get you quite far actually, and the scraping's super easy too. Um, should we roll the video? Yeah, so let's watch the film. It's like around 30 minutes, and we'll stick around and, and take more questions afterwards. Thanks. Thanks so far. This has been great. gestrahlt. Es ist noch heute so, wenn es an der Tür klingelt, denke ich manchmal, vielleicht war sie einfach nur verreist. Ich weiß nicht, ob es in meine Lebenszeit fällt, aber es wäre mein ganz großer Traum, dass irgendwann in großen, großen Schlagzeilen steht, wir haben den Krebs besiegt. Sie hat mir auch erzählt von Studien, die sie gelesen hat. Und ich weiß noch, wie viel Hoffnung ich hatte, als sie damit ankam, dass sie da was Neues gefunden hat. Und das war schon wie, es war so ein Strohhalm einfach. Was passiert, wenn sich vermeintlich wissenschaftliche Studien über das Netz verbreiten? Das ist ein Film über das Geschäft mit zweifelhafter Wissenschaft und dem Betrug an uns. Der Fall der Moderatorin Miriam Pielhau. Er zeigt mir, wie wir mit angeblichen Beweisen manipuliert werden können. Ihre Angst wurde ausgenutzt. Es ist sehr emotional. Ähm, Krebs macht Angst. Krebs macht furchtbar Angst. Der Moderatorin gaben zweifelhafte Studien eine große Hoffnung. Diese Art der Studien breitet sich aus. Rasend schnell. Ich frage mich, wem können wir noch vertrauen? Miriam Pielhau recherchiert unablässig zu ihrer Krankheit. Vor ihrem Tod schreibt sie ihrer Freundin von einem neuen, angeblich wissenschaftlich erprobten Mittel. Der Name geht sie maff. In einer E-Mail heißt es, ich bete und bitte, aber ich habe auch Hoffnung. Googelt mal geht's im Maff, wenn ihr Zeit dazu habt. Es wird mir die finale Heilung bringen. Ihre beste Freundin erinnert sich. Sie hat gesagt, äh, ich habe da jetzt ein Mittel entdeckt. Da werden äh, im Körper die äh, guten Zellen aktiviert und die Krebszellen werden dann von den körpereigenen Zellen quasi vernichtet. Wochen später schreibt sie dann, ein Schock. Keine Medikamente mehr, Mist. Chemos gibt's noch, ja, ins Blaue. 
Vielleicht wirkt sie, vielleicht auch nicht. Aber ich nehme keine fünfte mehr, das habe ich beschlossen. Stattdessen GCMAF, hochdosiert. Die Hersteller bewerben GCMAF aggressiv. Als wissenschaftlich getestetes Heilmittel. Es ist in Deutschland nicht als Medikament zugelassen, gilt als Nahrungsergänzungsmittel. Vier Monate vor ihrem Tod, Kurzurlaub mit der besten Freundin. Miriam Pielhau nimmt das Mittel regelmäßig. Sie vertraut darauf, ist niemand, der einfach auf Scharlatane hereinfällt. Miri war in Sachen Krebs eine Expertin, die wusste sehr viel, hat sich mit sämtlichen Studien beschäftigt. Und das war eine ganz, ganz große Hoffnung, die da geschürt wurde. GC Maff kostet viel Geld. Ein Geschäft mit der Hoffnung. Miriam Pielhau stirbt im Juli 2016 an Krebs. Die Wissenschaft und ihre Studien. Darauf baut unsere Gesellschaft. Eine große Studie. Es geht aus einer Studie hervor. Teils einer Studie. Wurde die Studie vorgestellt. Wir sind zu Recht stolz auf die Erkenntnisse der Forscher. Ein strenger Prozess bestimmt darüber, ob etwas als bewiesen gilt. Er ist international anerkannt und immer gleich. Wenn ein Wissenschaftler eine Studie geschrieben hat, schickt er sie an ein wissenschaftliches Journal. Erfahrene Wissenschaftler aus seinem Fach prüfen die Studie. So wird Unseriöses und Falsches aussortiert, Fehler korrigiert. Kontrolle durch Kollegen, Peer Review heißt der Prozess. Wir legen einer erfahrenen Krebsärztin die Studien zu GCMAF zur Prüfung vor. Sie stellt fest, offenbar gibt es eine Welt, in der die strengen Regeln des Peer Reviews nicht gelten. Als Reviewer würde man schon beim Lesen erhebliche Zweifel an den Daten haben und würde einfach sagen, das Ganze muss nochmal geschrieben werden und dann kann es nochmal eingereicht werden. Dann würde man es überprüfen, ob das korrigiert ist. Die Expertin findet viele Fehler. Die Studien betrachten nur Einzelfälle, benutzen ungeeignete Untersuchungsmethoden, sind voll von positiven Bewertungen. Sie sind so mangelhaft, dass sie eigentlich nie in einem wissenschaftlichen Journal hätten erscheinen dürfen. Mit den Studien brüstet sich der Hersteller von GCMAF auf Krebskongressen, wirbt manipulativ. 300 Wissenschaftler aus acht Nationen haben 180 Studien zu GCMAF geschrieben. Und wir haben 32 davon verfasst. But we have written 32 of them. Ich habe GCMAF zweimal in der Woche genommen und nach drei Wochen fühlte ich mich weniger müde. Das ist kein Quatsch. Das hat alles einen wissenschaftlichen Hintergrund. Ich glaube, für einen Laien ist das überhaupt nicht durchsichtig. Und ich glaube, das ist auch einer der Gründe, warum diese wissenschaftlichen Publikationen kommen. Nicht, dass man damit meint, die Fachwelt zu überzeugen, weil das sehen wir sofort, was da die Qualität ist, sondern dass man von den Internetseiten, wo das Laien verständlich erklärt ist, wo man auch ein Verkaufsangebot macht, dann auf diese wissenschaftlichen Artikel verweist. Wie kann es sein, dass solche Studien den wissenschaftlichen Prozess einfach so umgehen können? Mein Kollege und ich wollen das herausfinden. Machen uns zu Wissenschaftlern. Wir treiben es auf die Spitze. Ein Computerprogramm erzeugt für uns eine Studie aus völligem Unsinn. Wir haben nur den Absender eingegeben. Die Universität Himmelpforten, die es gar nicht gibt. Hier soll auch das Postamt vom Weihnachtsmann sein. Wir reichen das Papier dort ein, wo auch die Studien zu GCMAF erschienen sind. 85 Euro soll das kosten. Der Verlag gibt vor, ein Wissenschaftsverlag zu sein. Er nennt sich Science Publications, kurz SciPub, und listet 33 unterschiedliche Journale auf, mit mehr als 10.000 Studien. So wie SciPub gibt es viele unseriöse Pseudo-Verlage. 
Sie heißen Omix, Science Domain, IOS at Journals oder Wazet. Auf Nachfrage streiten sie ab, unseriös zu arbeiten oder reagieren gar nicht. Es ist eine Industrie, die sich ausbreitet, mit der viel Geld verdient wird. Wird unser Nonsenspapier durchgehen? Gerd Antes prüft seit mehr als 25 Jahren systematisch medizinische Studien. Ist wissenschaftlicher Vorstand der renommierten Cochrane Deutschland Stiftung. Dass jemand sagt, kann so durchgehen, kommt eigentlich nicht vor. Und wenn es vorkommt, ist das eigentlich ein sehr großes Alarmzeichen. Weil das heißt, da ist jemand entweder schlampig gewesen, oberflächlich oder zu großzügig. Unglaublich. Saipap hat unsere Quatschstudie angenommen. Und wir wollen noch weitergehen. Denn die Fake Science Branche veranstaltet auch sogenannte Fachkonferenzen. Auch hier reichen wir den Unsinn ein für eine internationale Konferenz in London. Bei der Weltakademie der Wissenschaft und Technologie, kurz WASET, gibt es alle drei Tage eine Konferenz. Angeblich findet auch hier ein Peer Review, die Prüfung durch Kollegen, statt. Doch unser Quatschpapier ging durch. Wir sollen den Vortrag halten. Letzte Probe vor dem Auftritt, richtig sicher sind wir noch nicht. Uh, together with my colleague Isabella Stein, also from the University of Applied Sciences of Lower Saxony at Himmelforten. And. <lacht> oh. Am nächsten Morgen steht uns der Auftritt als falsche Wissenschaftler bevor. Es stellt sich heraus, die großartig klingende Weltakademie der Wissenschaft veranstaltet ihre Konferenz in einem kleinen Konferenzraum und hat nur einen einzigen Mitarbeiter. Was für eine Täuschung. Dieser Mitarbeiter, Bora Adil, ist gleichzeitig der Sohn des Geschäftsführers. Unsere Nonsensstudie ist auch schon da. Gedruckt im Konferenzjournal ohne Änderungen. Also ganz offensichtlich ohne Peer Review, sonst wäre unser Blödsinn sofort aufgefallen. Jeder darf hier reden. Auf Mathematik folgt Ingenieurswissenschaft und koreanische Geschichte. Danach Filmkritik, alles durcheinander. Viele Wissenschaftler stehen unter Druck, müssen veröffentlichen, um Fördergelder zu bekommen. Ein seriöser Konferenzname macht einen guten Eindruck. Ich mache ein Projekt und muss zum Schluss publizieren. Eigentlich muss ich nur was haben, was wie eine gute Publikation aussieht, was einen guten Namen hat. Und wenn wir unseren Quatsch gleich vortragen? Wie werden wohl die Wissenschaftler darauf reagieren? Dann geht es los. Wir treten auf als Isabella Stein und Christian Schreibaumer von der Universität Himmelpforten. Bei uns geht es um ein Rechenprogramm mit dem wohlklingenden Namen MOB. Das, so haben wir uns ausgedacht, angeblich auch auf einem Gameboy funktioniert. Der totale Blödsinn. Jetzt nur nicht laut lachen. Zum Schluss ein falsches Plato-Zitat. Niemand merkt etwas. Es ist einfach kein Computerexperte dabei. Ohne Peer Review zur Veröffentlichung. Den einfachen Weg gehen. Deshalb seien sie hier, erzählen uns einige Wissenschaftler. Andere sind reingefallen auf einen der wohlklingenden Konferenznamen. Sie wollen reden, anonym. Ehrlich gesagt bin ich total schockiert. Ich war sehr früh heute Morgen da. Ich habe aber außer mir niemanden gesehen, nur einen Typ, der dort noch aufbaute und herumräumte. Das war alles sehr ungewöhnlich. Um was geht es den Machern der Konferenz? Da geht es nur um Geld. Das ist der einzige Zweck dieser Veranstaltung. Die Macher machen sich lustig über die Wissenschaft. Das ist respektlos. Und wenn Wissenschaftler hier häufiger wissentlich veröffentlichen, dann stellt das für mich die Glaubwürdigkeit ihrer Veröffentlichungen komplett in Frage. 
Rund 23.000 Euro hat diese Konferenz Wasset gebracht. Ein gutes Geschäft für Bora Adil. Wir werden ihn später wieder treffen. Wasset, die Weltakademie der Wissenschaft und Technologie, einfach nur Betrug. Oder sogar noch mehr. Eine Reihenwaschmaschine, eine Plattform für schlechte Wissenschaft, für Lobbyisten und Geschäftemacher, deren Theorien dann in die Gesellschaft gelangen. Als seriös präsentierte Wahrheit finden sie auch Einzug in den politischen Alltag. Eine nur in der Fantasie grüner Ideologen existierende Scheinkrise. Ich spreche vom Klimawandel. Weil der Klimawandel eben nicht menschengemacht ist. Die AfD hat Recht, Folgendes zu fordern. Zurück zur wissenschaftlich begründeten Vernunft in der deutschen und internationalen Klimapolitik. Er ist Teil dieser wissenschaftlich begründeten Vernunft. Der Nachname Limburg. Limburg. Michael Limburg, AfD-Mitglied und heute Gast. Als Experte im Brandenburger Landtag. Michael Limburg ist Vizepräsident von EIKE. Ein Institut für Energie und Klima, das die AfD wissenschaftlich berät. Na denn, wie erfolgt er hier? Für Eike publizieren Michael Limburg und zahlreiche weitere Wissenschaftler ihre Studien, die angeblich auch einen Peer-Review durchlaufen haben. Sie präsentieren sich seriös. Aber auch Artikel. Für das AfD-nahe Institut ist das von großer Bedeutung. Sie gewinnen damit Glaubwürdigkeit. Wir sind ja heute im Zeitalter der ja, Aufklärung hoffentlich immer noch. Und die Wissenschaft gibt uns, wenn man sie richtig betreibt, die Möglichkeit, den Dingen auf den Grund zu gehen und Glauben von Wissen zu trennen. Landtagssitzung in Brandenburg. Michael Limburg warnt vor den Gesundheitsgefahren durch Windkraft. Die Nutzung der Windenergie unermesslichen Schaden über die betroffenen Bürger gebracht hat. Schaden, der sich in großflächiger Landschaftszerstörung äußert. Schaden an der Gesundheit der betroffenen Bürger, die durch den ständigen Infraschall erzeugt durch diese Industriemonster auf dauerhaft beeinträchtigt wird. Michael Limburg beruft sich auf Studien, die den Klimawandel als Naturphänomen ausgemacht haben wollen. Keinerlei Hinweise, keinerlei Beweis dafür gibt, dass das menschgemachte CO2 auf irgendeine mysteriöse Weise die Temperatur dieses Planeten, der Atmosphäre dieses Planeten erwärmt. Doch wir finden heraus, dass einige der Eike Klimastudien genau bei den Fake-Verlagen erschienen sind, die jeden Quatsch veröffentlichen. Ich reiche eine neue Fantasiestudie ein. Bei genau der gleichen Fachzeitschrift, bei der auch ein Eike-Wissenschaftler veröffentlicht hat. Unser Unsinn geht durch, genau wie die Eike-Studie. Unsere ist ja völliger Quatsch. Und die Studien von Eike? Zumindest Zweifel wären angebracht, finden wir. Und Michael Limburg? Niemand hat Einsteins ähm, Relativitätstheorie jemals einem Peer-Review unterzogen. Was soll ich dazu sagen? Es ist ein Versuch, das abzuwerten, ohne sich mit den Inhalten beschäftigen zu müssen. Studien mit vorgetäuschtem Peer-Review. Gerade bei kritischen Themen. Sie können uns manipulieren. Der Schaden ist natürlich auch dramatisch, wenn man sich jetzt mal überlegt, dass die Klimaverschiebung oder wie man das nennen will, wirklich eine weltbedrohende Entwicklung ist. Wenn Sie jetzt sich überlegen, also mal ausmalen, fantasievoll, was es bedeutet, wenn Sie dort jetzt mit gefakten Wissenschafts- und Forschungsergebnissen rauskommen, dann ist es ja einleuchtend, dass der Schaden maximal ist. Die AfD macht offenbar auch mit ungeprüften Studien Politik. Auf Nachfrage dazu keine Antwort. Bei Waset und Co. finden wir auch Unternehmen. Wie den Tabakkonzern Philip Morris. Es wird zu angeblich unschädlichen Zigaretten veröffentlicht. Auf Nachfrage will man sich nicht äußern. Eine Reaktorfirma schreibt über Sicherheit bei Störfällen. Der Pharma-Riese Bayer zu Aspirin plus C. Auch BMW und Airbus veröffentlichen hier. Die Studien gut, mittelmäßig oder falsch? Keiner weiß es, denn niemand hat es geprüft. Auf Nachfrage geben sich die Unternehmen erschrocken. Falsche Verlage, das Problem sei unbekannt. Ungeprüfte Studien, sie sind auch in Dokumenten der Europäischen Kommission, in Patentanträgen für Medizinprodukte und 
und in der Datenbank des Gemeinsamen Bundesausschusses. Er entscheidet, ob ein Medikament von der Krankenkasse bezahlt wird. Auf Anfrage versichert uns der GBA, die Studien wären bei der Bewertung der Medikamente ausgeschlossen worden. New York. Hier findet wieder eine waset konferenz statt. Mein Kollege und ich wollen einen Wissenschaftler aus Hannover treffen, dessen Institut seit Jahren zu solchen Konferenzen fährt. Was treibt Wissenschaftler an? Dass sie hier präsentieren, so zur Verbreitung der Fake-Verlage beitragen. Wir treffen auf eine Professorin aus Brasilien, die das Geschäftsmodell durchschaut. Das hat mit Wissenschaft nichts zu tun. Es ist eine kommerzielle Institution, die mit Wissenschaft ihr Geld macht. Dann ist er da, der Wissenschaftler aus Hannover. Er kommt mit seiner Freundin. Zwei Stunden, nachdem die Konferenz offiziell angefangen hat. Er ist Abteilungsleiter seit fünf Jahren am Institut. Mit dem Geld seines Instituts unterstützt er das Geschäft der Fake-Verlage. Ich finde es hochgradig unverantwortlich von seriösen Wissenschaftlern, dort zu publizieren, wo erkennbar und vorsichtig unseriösen Autoren der Raum gegeben wird und um die damit aufzuwerten. Warum ist der Wissenschaftler aus Hannover trotzdem hier? Warum gibt er öffentliche Gelder aus, um auf eine Fake-Konferenz nach New York zu fliegen? Vor der Kamera will er nicht antworten. Im Gespräch sagt er lediglich, New York sei eine wunderschöne Stadt. Und er sei nun der Letzte seines Instituts, der auf eine waset konferenz fliegen dürfe. In Zukunft sei das untersagt. Das Institut für Fabrikanlagen und Logistik an der Universität Hannover. Ein Verantwortlicher hat einem Interview zugestimmt. Peter Niehus, Leiter des Bereichs. Er berät die Bundesregierung im Deutschen Wissenschaftsrat und arbeitet an millionenschweren Forschungsprojekten. 29 Mal stand auch sein Name mit auf waset publikationen Ich erzähle ihm von New York. Eine Antwort, die erste, die er gab, war, weil New York eine wunderschöne Stadt ist. Ja, das sind ja öffentliche Gelder. Wie erklären Sie oder wie rechtfertigen Sie das? Ich meine, das sind ja Steuergelder, um die es da geht. Also ich, ich, die Organisation hat gelernt. Also ich denke mal, das ist wie gesagt, dieser Prozess ist bei uns beschrieben, den kann man gerne sich auch anschauen. Es ist nicht so, dass wir auf diese Dinge nicht reagieren. Die Frage ist, wie lange dauert es, bis man reagiert, bis man das wirklich mitbekommt. Und ja, natürlich sind es Steuergelder oder sind es Gelder vom Förderer, das sind aber letztendlich auch Steuergelder, die dort mit eingesetzt werden. Die Schlussfolgerung ist die, die wir geschlossen haben. Man kann nicht mehr hingehen. Aber ist das dann nicht ein Stück weit Täuschung, wenn ich ein, ein Papier als Review zum Beispiel auf meine Publikationsliste schreibe? Ähm, es hat aber kein Review stattgefunden durch ja. Kollegen. Ja, geht nicht. Also zweifelsohne. Das wird äh, uns was vorgegaukelt. Und in dem Moment, wo es angegeben wird, äh, wo wir es auch äh, kommunizieren als Review Paper, äh, gaukeln wir eigentlich anderen auch was vor. Äh, wobei ich sagen muss, eigentlich... Äh, nicht wissentlich, dass wir dort eben einer solchen, einem solchen System aufgesessen sind. Und der Wissenschaftler aus Hannover, den wir in New York getroffen haben, zu ihm direkt äußert sich das Institut nicht. Welche Wissenschaftler haben noch bei Fake-Verlagen veröffentlicht? Wir schließen uns mit weiteren ARD-Journalisten, dem Süddeutsche Zeitung, Magazin und internationalen Partnern zusammen. Wir hätten 170.000 Publikationen von unterschiedlichen Fake-Verlagen aus. Es ist ein gigantischer Kosmos. Es sind rund 400.000 Wissenschaftler dabei. Sogar aus Harvard und Stanford. Und mehr als 100 deutsche Universitäten und Forschungseinrichtungen, darunter die Charité Berlin, die TU München, die Fraunhofer Gesellschaft, die RWTH Aachen und die Universität Hannover. Insgesamt publizieren mehr als 5000 deutsche Wissenschaftler, allein bei drei der großen Fake-Verlage. Alle, die wir per E-Mail darauf ansprechen, schreiben, 
Sie hätten nichts von der Unseriosität dieser Verlage gewusst. Es seien Einzelfälle und man wolle das Problem angehen. Also dass wir natürlich bei uns auch genug schwarze Schafe herumlaufen haben, das ist völlig klar. Aber das Ausmaß, was ich jetzt an Ihren Zahlen gesehen habe, das ist schon sehr erstaunlich. Vor allen Dingen, weil es auch so in alle Bereiche reingeht. Lindau am Bodensee. Jährliches Nobelpreisträgertreffen. Viele Wissenschaftler berichten uns, der Druck, ständig zu veröffentlichen, sei enorm. Eine dramatische Entwicklung der letzten Jahre. Und das würden die Fake-Verlage ausnutzen, einen einfachen Weg anbieten. Stefan Hell, Nobelpreisträger Chemie von 2014. Er berichtet, täglich würde er mit Werbemails von Fake-Verlagen überschüttet. Einladungen, diesen einfachen Weg zu nutzen. Wenn das ähm, sagen wir mal, System hat und, und, und Leute nicht nur sagen wir mal, einfach reinfallen auf irgendwas, sondern das sogar nutzen, und dann, ähm, dann muss man das abstellen. Und da kann, man, da kann man sich jetzt natürlich überlegen, wie stellt man das ab. Er sieht die Wissenschaft in der Pflicht zu handeln. Doch den meisten ist das Ausmaß des Problems unbekannt. Robert Huber, Chemie-Nobelpreisträger von 1988. So, das ist diese Fake-Publikation. Wir zeigen ihm unsere falsche Studie, berichten von den Recherchen. Auch er wurde schon eingeladen auf eine Konferenz eines Fake-Verlags. Er dachte sich nichts dabei. Das seriös aussehende Foto von seinem Vortrag nutzt der Anbieter jetzt als Werbung. Bis wir ihm davon berichten, wusste er nichts davon. Die Veranstaltung an sich sei unauffällig gewesen. Kriminell findet er aber das Geschäftsmodell dieser Verlage. Das ist Betrug, der muss, der muss verfolgt werden, das, das ist klar. Es darf jeder einen Verlag gründen, eine Zeitschrift herausgeben aber und, und sich Autoren suchen. Das ist alles nur ganz fair. Aber dann auch äh, sich an das, was er verspricht, halten. Wenn er das nicht tut, bedrückt er. Vazet macht einfach weiter. Eine Konferenz in Berlin. Bora Adil kassiert wieder 450 Euro. Im Jahr macht Vazet damit geschätzt 3 Millionen Euro. Wir haben versucht, mehr über das türkische Familienunternehmen herauszufinden. Doch es gibt noch nicht einmal einen offiziellen Geschäftssitz. Wir haben bereits schriftlich angefragt, aber keine Antwort bekommen. Jetzt wollen wir direkt nachfragen. Ist das Science? Ist das Wissenschaft? Bora Adil windet sich. Sagt, er sei ja nur ein kleiner Mitarbeiter. Am Ende keine Antwort. Nur selten gibt es Konsequenzen für die Veranstalter von Fake-Konferenzen oder die Macher gefälschter Studien. Die britischen Hersteller des vermeintlichen Krebsmittels GZMAF sind eine Ausnahme. Im November soll ihnen in London der Prozess gemacht werden. Zu gern hat sich der Geschäftsführer immer als Saubermann präsentiert. In den Akten heißt es, er hätte GCMAF unrechtmäßig als Krebsmedikament verkauft, auf Grundlage von falschen Studien. Auch auf unsere Anfrage hin keine Antwort. Aber die falschen Studien, ihre vermeintlich wissenschaftlichen Heilsversprechen sind in der Welt. Das angebliche Wissen über GCMAF verbreitet sich zum Beispiel über das Buch weiter, das Miriam Pielhau über ihre Krankheit schrieb. Ich denke, es wäre in Miris Sinne, wenn sie das damals dann erfahren hätte, es eben jetzt genauso zu verkünden. Und das, finde ich, ist natürlich auch wichtig, dass man da jetzt aufklärt. Zweifelhafte Studien. Ein Millionengeschäft für die Macher. Eine Gefahr für die Gesellschaft. Wer kann das stoppen? Man werde diese Fehlentwicklungen untersuchen, heißt es vom Bundesministerium für Bildung und Forschung. Aber am Ende liege die Verantwortung bei den Wissenschaftlern. Ich bin ehrlicherweise total gespannt, was passiert. Ich hätte zwei Tipps. Der eine Tipp ist, es gibt einen großen Knall. Der zweite Tipp ist, die wissenschaftliche Community wird alles tun, um das ganz schnell verschwinden zu lassen. Ich fürchte, wir machen Nummer zwei. Dann zu sehen, dass sozusagen unsere Existenzgrundlage maximal geh- und zerstört wird, dann 
stelle ich mir lieber nicht vor, wie es in 15 Jahren aussieht. Schwer vorstellbar, in einer Welt zu leben, in der man nicht mehr unterscheiden kann zwischen dem, was bewiesen ist und dem, was gefaked ist. Wem soll man dann noch glauben und was, wenn man keinem mehr glauben kann? I've got to figure out how to stop this. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> It starts again and again. You're I'm trapped serious. in some loophole and time continuum. Thank you so much. For Thanks for sticking around. For sticking around and, and for watching even. It was all in German and only subtitled. We shared the link on Twitter. So if you want to share the video, it is on my station's website, also subtitled. Spread the word. I think if nobody goes there, if nobody, pu nobody publishes there, This is a pretty easy way to end their business model. Thank you. Yeah, we're, we'll uh, <laughs> happy to take a few questions while we, while we clear up and before we get thrown out. Uh, there was a couple of points. We haven't figured out where all of the money went. Um, you know, for the, for the conferences, what else does that fund? So there, there's some interesting angles to explore and we'll be uh, digging a little bit deeper. And if, if anybody asked themselves what actually happened to our terrible cancer paper with the bees, you know, because we thought, oh, we, we don't want this to be out in the public anymore, right? We just try to prove a point here. So what we did, we wrote a, an email to Omics saying, oh, you know what, we made some terrible mistakes. And by terrible mistakes, we mean everything. The mythology is crappy. We, we sent them like a whole list of stuff that is uh, completely wrong and asked them to take the paper offline. So guess what happened? They wanted to charge us. They said, oh yeah, sure, you can take it offline, but we need a retraction fee, whatever that is, uh, for 2,000 euros. Uh, so we didn't pay, but the moment we kind of said that we were journalists investigating their predatory publishing model, the same day, the thing was gone. So it's no longer there, luckily, but it, it had, we had to really you know, put them under pressure with journalistic research, because if we were just normal people, that we, we, we would have to pay 2,000 euros to get the stuff removed. So they, they earn money both ends. So, yeah. It looks like there's a question over there. I might not be able to hear you. You may need to come a little bit further forward, but you can shout. Give it a go. Uh, do you have anybody at your current uh, cybersecurity conference in Canada right now? Uh, no. Um, <laughs> I wish we did, but there was a lady that uh, tweeted the Wasset Watch website uh, yesterday and said, oh, you should have seen the scenes in Vancouver when people found out this was like a bullshit factory. Um, so it might be interesting to follow up with her and see what was going on. But there was also a, uh, a US.gov paper, I think, that was submitted to, to that conference. Not the cybersecurity conference, but one of the conferences out of the 150-odd conferences held in that small room. There's a, uh, another question there? Yeah, you, with, sorry, I mean, that's vague, but yeah. Anyways, um, do you think that when these kind of organizations have been deemed as fake and was not the public opinion, that actually a couple of PhD degrees and was not going to be revoked from people? So the question is if, uh, I guess, if papers have been published there, um, maybe some PhDs might be provoked. What do we think about that? Uh, not provoked. Um, What's the word for it? Revoked. Revoked, yeah. It's been a long day. We actually can't tell, maybe. I mean, all what we could do is spread the word and make this whole thing public. And, and, and we confronted many, many universities with our findings. And uh, now it's up to them what they do. Uh, probably they will have to look into the specific papers, whether or not they are worth of, of the scientific label and, uh, or not. So I think it, it's, it's up to the universities in the end. Please. Uh, <coughs> thank you for great work. Um, you say it's up to the universities. Is there no international or national level clearinghouse or agency that who's supposed to be doing this job that you guys have been doing? Who's supposed to be doing the job that us guys have been doing in, I guess, holding these folks to account, right? Yeah. Well, to our knowledge, there is no like national or international entity that controls 
uh, the publication process of scientists. So uh, I think there, there, there needs to be more like this. You know, it's, it's hard, to, hard to make this there, happen. There, there is a freedom of publication for scientists. And I think this is a very important good that you can publish your study wherever you want. For us, the problem is only if you publish your study and you write peer-reviewed and scientifically on it, then it, you know, what's on it should be in it. And, and this is with this predatory publisher, which is not. So um, the universities, I think th there is some kind of blacklisting, whitelisting going on right now. And we, we definitely wanted to contribute to, to this. And I think this could be a way, blacklisting, whitelisting, then uh, because of our research, many us universities and institutions in Germany, they do like FAQs and do's and don'ts. So the community right now tries to help itself. And I think this is a good solution, but we will look in one year or one and a half year, we will look again if the, the scientific community is able to, to cure this. And, I mean, I'm not pessimistic, probably. Before. Because I think one of the, we have to understand one of the reasons why this business model is successful is because it's also a, a business with shame. You know, you go there as a young researcher, maybe, or even as a established researcher, you, 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 you get your paper there, you pay the publication fee, you go to this conference and you find out, oh, damn, this is some sort of a scam. I fell for some, some weird deceptive business practice. But nobody knows. So you go home, they ask you, oh, how was the conference? Do you really say, I was scammed, sorry, this was a big mistake, I actually, you know, throw away government money or funding money? Many people don't have the guts to do this. Uh, and they just say, ah, well, it was okay-ish, and try to answer it short sentences and, and hope that people talk about something else. And so this is, this is definitely a goal from our research that, that the public knows about this and that, that, that there's awareness about this. And I think after the publication, it's hard to, to say forward. we didn't know. And yeah. also to encourage people to come forward. We even, when you Google best presentation award, was it? Ooh, ooh, ooh. So many universities give out press releases, you know, having this like people are holding this. I got a press presentation award from Buzzard because they probably were too ashamed to tell at home. Yeah, please. Is there a model or characteristics or criteria that one could use to identify a fake publishing company? So I see a paper that's cited, you know, or published by this this publisher, and they have a publishing company, and well. Other than submitting a fake paper and having to have a garbage mm -hmm. there is a, There's an answer to that, and that is journals do have what they call impact factors, and promotion and tenure committees do look at the impact factors when they look at the publications. But like was mentioned earlier, if they've got like 80, 90% good publications, they could slide some of these ones with lower impact factors in, and the university probably wouldn't even look at those papers to see how bad they were. The question was if there are criterias uh, so that I can see if it's a predatory journal or not. So one answer is impact factors. So of course you can look at the impact factors if um, they are very low or if they are not existent. This might be a hint. But there are also new publications or new journals out there, for example, so that there are courageous people founding a journal and making a good peer review, but they don't have an impact factor. So this is, this is not the only criterion. And it's, I, I must admit, it's very hard to definitely say this is a fake a journal or, or something like this. What we did for our research was we had vi um, more criteria, so submitting a fake paper was only one. But look at the website. Is there an office or a bureau? Is, is there an address, an official and address? And is it legit, or is it, for, for example, some of them have addresses in London, but if you Google the address, it's just a, 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 somebody who sells addresses, like virtual office addresses like this. There are some lists out there. There's a, there's a guy that, we, that, 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 that he's called Jeffrey Beale. Uh, he, he did a lot of research in this, and he, he published something that is called Beale's List, uh, where he did his own research and published and, and made it public, which papers and journals and, and, and conference organizers he deems uh, predatory. So 
again there's some problem with just you know a single person doing this and, and having a list as a definitive list but this is definitely a good hint he did some amazing job there. There's another company that's called Cabels. Uh, they offer some black and white lists as well. They're subscription based so they for them it's a business model too. For, but me for medical paper there's PubMed yeah. and there's also uh, whitelisting in India so they what we did for the research was looking at different whitelists, blacklists from the country. It's, it's a hard job to, 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 to find that out. It, it's a hard job for, for scientists, for journalists. But, but I think with these companies we researched, I think you, you can be pretty sure for these companies. Yeah. If it's omics or was it or science domain or sci yes. you're pretty... For omics, there you have the FTC investigating this. For um, uh, Vazet, uh, the CUNY case, there's also investigation going on in New York. So this is also a hint for a predatory publisher, please. How does it feel to inspire the next Capcom contest? <laughs> 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 That's true, yeah. <laughs> It can run all day, every day, if you like. Um, there was a question over there uh, first. That guy had his hand up a while I'm ago. Curious. It seems like if your paper's accepted in a few weeks, you probably have a pretty good indication that this is a fake publication. Absolutely. It, 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 it's, it's like you're all staying with a straight face. Oh, gosh, I had no idea. Mm -hmm. Did anybody, like, off the record say to you, yeah, I know exactly what I'm doing. I just need to pad my resume. Sure. Sure. In London, for example, at the conference, there, there was a guy, he, he was really funny. Uh, he was from India and, and he was pretty frank and honest. And he was a professor, so I think he, he did not have anything to lose. And we asked him and he said, of course, I know this is a fake conference, but anybody, anybody from India has to see London one time. So, <laughs> of course, yeah, yeah, there are people uh, using the system, of course, there are. But and if you have like 29 publications there, uh, you should probably be a, bit, a little bit suspicious about, about the practice. But the thing is, I mean, when we submitted our fake cancer paper there, we got some comments. They were super superficial, you know. I mean, this paper was full of mistakes. We just presented a few of them here, but it was really, we, we wrote it with the purpose of being discovered in a way, and we did not. So the comments we, we got back were so superficial that we thought this is absolutely no proper peer review. But if you are like a scientist who considers the research great, you know, you think you, you did an amazing job and the, the only review you get after two days, which should raise some eyebrows, I agree, but, but when those only comments are, this is an amazing paper, you should just maybe change one, uh, one, one sub-headline somewhere, you think, oh, I did a good job. So many people don't, don't have maybe the self-criticism to see uh, that this is not a proper peer review. Please. Yes, very, very good question. Um, after uh, how big is Wasset and how many people are working there. So we went to three Wasset conferences and of, we had these international partners. So I don't know on how many Wasset conferences we were in total, but probably six or eight with, you know, in South Korea and, and in several other places. And we think, yes, it's a family business and Bora uh, is doing Europe. We spotted him in Europe, in Copenhagen, in Berlin, in London. Um, then we're thinking his father, uh, Chemal, he's doing uh, Asia and also Turkey. And then they have some kind of franchise in the US, so this was not a family member we met in New York. And we're thinking the daughter maybe is doing the books or something, so she's doing the work behind. So it's a, it's a very, very small company. And I think they can be a small company because they, there's not so much work to do. It's, so all that Bora was doing at the conferences we went to was really literally just sitting outside the conference room collecting money and giving out name tags. I left his laptop unlocked all the time, by the way. <laughs> and you, you, you know, you just upload your presentation on a USB stick, so you just, maybe I shouldn't have said that. Uh, <laughs> oh no, it's no problem. These guys, they, they had a funny story when they, you know, they, uh, they worked with these 23 different media partners and I think there was one conference where there were a whole bunch of people presenting their bullshit papers at the same conference, but none of them knew that the other, so 
It was like a full conference of bullshit papers by these me They're like, are you a journalist? Are you, are you a journalist? <laughs> yeah. It was hard to tell. <laughs> Please. A little more seriously, have you talked to tax authorities about these guys? Have we talked to who, sorry? The tax authorities. The tax authorities. Um, yeah. I, I, have we talked to the tax authorities? Um, I don't know what the U.S. tax authorities are, but I did notify the uh, the FTC and the FBI and figured at some point maybe they'd get around to something like that. Um, and I did that in a few countries as, as, as well, not just the U.S., but um, like Canada, where they were having conferences last year and, and so on. <coughs> so folks are aware about it. Yeah, there's a question there. Yeah, I'm curious. Sorry, I, I, I didn't. So is, was the question, correct me if I'm wrong, but, um, you know, have we looked into how to deal with the sort of the avalanche of spam that academics are getting from these various publishers and how many people are responding and what sort of people are responding? Uh, I'm, I'm, I've not looked. Have you guys looked at that? No, it's, it's, it's hard to tell. I mean, we kind of think that most people who end up publishing there have at some degree responded to those spam emails that most academics know and we received in bulk after we, we made those fake institutions and, and, and all these kind of things. So um, we were also wondering who would reply to that. But actually those spam emails, they really vary in sophistication. Some of them are just, hi, you researcher, you want published this great. So okay. But some of them were really like giving the, 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 the correct titles, citing some work that we have done, saying, oh, we, we read that you did some work on cancer. Do you want to do this and this and this? So. This, some of them don't really look like your just really normal spam. And, and again, if you don't suspect people to be that, that evil, if you don't suspect uh, predatory publishers to exist, you could think this is a legitimate request for, for publication. You think, oh, they discovered my greatness. Finally, somebody found out what great research I'm doing and they invite me to publish. Oh, yeah, great, I want to do this. So yeah. some, some people definitely fall for this for this reason. Uh, I mean, I didn't get um, an email invite. I, I Googled it. You know, it's like political psychology. I wasn't aware of this. It's like I'll look for a conference. That looks kind of legit. It looked exactly like an IEEE conference. So I wasn't on the wiser. So, yeah, I guess people are searching and maybe finding the conferences that way too. I mean, we, we did eventually get all of the stuff removed once we started talking about it with journalists, things went pretty quickly. Um, and then like a couple of weeks ago, we uploaded a, a, the full paper to a, a prepub server, osf.io, um, and we'll be you know, submitting the paper for the whole peer review process. Please. Yeah, yes, we, we, it, in, in the US, this is the first, yeah, this, you are the first who, who hear about this, who, we, we, we haven't. Who was the lady you mentioned? Rachel Maddow. Rachel Maddow. NSNBC. No, I don't. I don't know. Have we? Yes, we. We teamed up with the New Yorker because the writer there he already did a story about this um, this fake predatory. Also, yes. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. We we will probably come off. Yeah, yeah, and sure. write it write it down because we, you know, Germany far away from the U.S. and <laughs> we work together. So Mother Jones picked up the research that we did, and uh, there is an institution, an amazing one that you all should support. It's the International uh, uh, the, the ICIJ, International Consortium for for Investigative Journalism. They su so, so supplied us with some some help uh, connecting with other journalists, and they gave us some technical infrastructure where we could share findings on an encrypted basis, so that not not everyone could could read that uh, the work 
work that we were doing. So, and this is an American institution too, so they work together with American. But it's, especially for the US, there's, there is lots of research what can be done, especially if you want to follow cases like the Malincrod case or if you want to follow all the CO2 collision case, because we, we did not research these cases until the end or the governmental cases. And we, we wanted to leave you know, something special for DEF CON, so we, were kind of, we didn't want to have too much information in the US before DEF CON. Mm -hmm. uh, and so we were constantly worried that, oh, this might just kick off. Um, and, you know, so please don't. And, and so, yeah, now we're, we're happy for it to be broad. <laughs> yes, please. Also, I, I spoke, spoke with our legal person from the station before DEF CON because this definitely is a GitHub project. It's, it's private, but uh, he did not want to cover for this. So it, I, I would have loved to make this private project public here. This would, would have been great. So, but, but you know, as these companies, especially Omics, they are really willing to fight. Uh, so, so I could not release it, but I mean, if there's a researcher who really is interested in doing this, then just, you know, give me a shout out so maybe we can do something. Yeah, it's pretty straightforward. So if, if somebody happened to do that and put it out there. <laughs> <laughs> please. Yes, please yeah. Oh, that's awesome. That we would be a good a idea. That's the follow-up. Thanks for that. <laughs> no. Create our own yeah. journal. <laughs> we should come up with a name. That's the next challenge, though. But the International Journal of Bullshit. <laughs> that would be <laughs> my suggestion. IJB. <laughs> uh, yeah, IBS. <laughs> Correct, yeah. Okay. Thank All right. You Thanks so much for this. This has been a pleasure.